So guys, it's an absolute uh, pleasure to welcome you all um, to this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Michael Diamond. I'm the academic director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Program uh, within the School of Professional Studies in our Division of Programs in Business. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to continue these dialogues um, that our colleagues in Shanghai, Paul Lin and Bryce Whitwam have been curating over the last year or so. Um, we have uh, 1,100 students in our two programs from all around the world. And we're pleased to have been able to um, gather 160 students uh, this semester in Shanghai itself on our campus uh, so that they could also pursue their graduate education before coming to New York. Um, but the conversation is, is larger than that. Uh, we have thought for a long time there was a real need for a dialogue um, uh, between America and China, especially around the innovation, the level of innovation and um, you know, the new insights that have become generated by the Chinese market, things that all marketers and communicators should be thinking about, learning, studying, um, you know, engaging with. And in that context, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Josh Gardner, uh, who is the CEO of Kung Fu Data and one of the most well-respected uh, sort of online analysts and, and thinkers and speakers about the space. Uh, a man, I, I believe, known for his infograms. And uh, so we may well uh, get some insight into that side of him as well. But without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Josh, who has a presentation for us. Um, if at any point you have questions, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I know that Josh has some sort of interactive elements, so you want to watch the chat. Uh, but please feel free to pop things in the Q&A if you want questions to be answered towards the end. So we'll go about 30, 40 minutes uh, with Josh, and then we'll take some questions formally after that. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Michael. I am very grateful to be here. I wanted to start with, um, I have to be honest, I'm a bit intimidated. I thought, uh, I was assuming this was gonna be a very intimate classroom setting with a room full of eager young minds. And instead, uh, Bryce and Paul and you and your team had bigger plans and decided to pack the house. So I'm honored. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, grateful to be here and, and have a chance to share with you what I know. Uh, a bit about me, as Michael mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kung Fu Data and E-Commerce Group, whose sole mission is to help brands thrive in digital China. Um, and so for the last eight years, I've had the privilege, the unique privilege of leading an A-team responsible for the success of more than 100 uh, brands online in China. And during that time, I've met with thousands of executives across hundreds of brands in at least 50 categories. I've learned a lot, I've seen a lot, and I've done a lot. And today, I'm going to share with you some of those experiences. And my fondest hope is that they, those experiences, are valuable to you in some way. So let's begin. I'm going to pull up my screen, and we're going to start the show. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So this is a big topic. Now it's a bit controversial as we all know. Can you run China from abroad? Um, I noticed uh, Paul posting this <laughs> in some group chats in Shanghai in, that I'm also in. And you know, immediately you see a whole bunch of people, no, <laughs> you know? it's like, I already know the answer. Don't need to attend. Uh, I think today you're gonna find that that is maybe not so true. So, um, Let's start with the big question. And uh, I know a lot of you are students, and uh, I know this is maybe a big leap of faith for you, but I want you to imagine after you graduate, you're probably gonna have, if you're an international business, you've studied in Shanghai, you're graduating from NYU, there's gonna be a moment that you might be working for a foreign brand. I mean, there's a pretty good chance, right? You're in PR and marketing. And if the brands have any sense at all, they're gonna be taking a look at China. Right, they're gonna they're gonna plan to enter the market, and so when we talk about this big question, the way I say it is: Look, if you think about China, right, it's like the states, but only it's more complicated, right? You think of it, it's very big, right? China's huge. So I want you to take this on not as an exciting project, but the reality is you're going to be working in a company that's probably mid-size or large, right? Or even if it's a D to C brand, it's probably extremely well funded. 
before it enters China. What I find is that most brands don't plan to enter the market when they start. It's always as sort of a continuation of a rollout they're doing globally when they finally decide to expand. And at that stage, those brands are kind of big, right? So again, this is gonna be a scary thing. You are now, and I want you to imagine this, you are in charge of expansion planning to enter the Chinese market, okay? So absorb that for a second. Now, I want you to do something very quickly. Um, and this is before we get into the meat of this presentation. As that leader of that expansion team, I wanna know, I want you to type into the chat, A, if you would set up a local team in China to run your business, or B, if you would hire partners to run the show and support China from abroad. Okay, so I want you to do that right now. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna start uh, advising you in different ways. The first is I'm gonna tell you a bit of a story as to why this is more complicated than when you go into normal markets. I have a very close friend who is in Shanghai with me on an entrepreneur's forum for five years, and we're very close. And I remember when he was exiting, he was repatriating to South Africa. Um, he was expected to share, it was like an exit interview. And he was expected to share his gold nuggets of living and working in China. And the interesting thing about him is he's in his 20s at the time, well, the early 30s before he left. Um, and, but what was interesting about what Michael is that, you know, he ran a pretty large business. I mean, his family's business globally is quite huge. And they had a significant presence in China as we traveled everywhere. And um, I remember this and I, it stuck with me. He said, you know, I've been all over China. And what I realized, and this is a guy who's been everywhere in the world. He's lived in like six or seven countries. And he, he had a huge ship in China, hundreds of offices, tens of thousands of employees. I mean, it's a very big operation. And what he said struck me. He said, you know what I realized after all this time here is that China is really big and my world is really small. And I thought about that and I said, wow, here's a guy who's like families are titans of an industry and it is a type of marketing business. Uh, and, and he himself, after five years, became humbled by his experience in China. And I think that's something I wanna start with because what you just typed in, whether you think you're right or wrong, you're trying to get an A on my test. The truth is I didn't expect you to type A or B. And what you're gonna find is in this presentation, the answer is, not necessarily one or the other. Maybe we're asking the wrong question. So I'm gonna recommend everyone, because you're students and you're reading a lot, read a book that's gonna be fun for you to read, okay? It is a fictionalized biography of a famous American entrepreneur that no one really knows about. I mean, you don't hear about him much. I mean, I've never, I mean, until I read this book, I didn't know anything about this guy. The name of the book is The Fish that ate the whale. And it's about the life experience of a famous entrepreneur named Sam Zamuri, who basically started from zero and became and took over the largest producer of bananas in the world. So the largest fruit distribution company in the world was his by the time he was done in his career. And this book, I'm mentioning it for a reason. This book is fun to read and the author does a great job describing the, the sort of story of this man. And why is it important to you? You're seeing a quote from it. It's because this book is perhaps the best primer on how to expand a business abroad and do it right and make money. So if you're going into international business and you're gonna grow an international organization with offices around the world and you're gonna work in complex markets like China, this is the book for you. And I'm gonna start with this first quote because it's funny, right? A corporation ages like a person. That am amazing spirit that built the business, that, that created the explosion in sales and success, it goes away to middle age, becomes comfortable. And what happens when a business gets to scale is that you have a lot of employees, you have a lot of stakeholders within the company and, and you become self-conscious, right? You're working on a team and you guys are gonna be junior, right? You're joining a team and you're gonna have a certain self-consciousness about you, right? And you're gonna be acting just like an executive team. No one wants to take 
the China project on. Why? Because it's a hot potato, right? They know it could be a problem. So they're covering their butts. They're asking questions. They're like, how will, I, how will this look if I go this way? What will they say if I take this? No one wants that risk, okay? But what leads from that sort of culture when you approach a market like China is the source of many problems for businesses coming here. And that's what we call the headquarters knows best syndrome. And this is deadly, right? Because HU knows right, right? I mean, this is a company that's super successful. You worship the CEO. He's built an amazing business in China. You've got the, you know, the, the executive team, the managing director of Europe, and she's amazing. Like she's built a titan of industry in that. And you're like, wow, they can never be wrong, right? Well, that's not really true, right? And, and that's the reason is most companies can't go beyond their original success. The environment where they were successful, it, it's very hard to break out of what they call the stack layer, right? So if you were very good at one thing, it's very hard for you to migrate to something else. It's a rare business that can change its business model and succeed long-term. It's an even rarer business that can go to markets around the world and succeed, right? So a couple of examples to start. Uh, of, of clients of mine, just to give you an idea of what this headquarters knows best syndrome is and why it's so dangerous. Um, I was uh, involved with a very large brand group with a massive team in Shanghai. I mean, they're huge in physical retail. And they also have a team in Hong Kong that's quite large. And I was actually shocked, this is in the FMCG space, that the decision you know, keep in mind, I'm always involved on the e-commerce side of things, right? So I was very puzzled by the fact that the CEO, the global CEO of the company and the global CEO of the consulting company, they're like house consultants, a, a top five, were deciding how e-commerce was gonna be run in China. And the global CEO hired the consulting firm to be the operator. And I thought that was bizarre, right? And I'm telling you, fast forward two years, this was a disaster. Team All's team was involved. We were involved. I mean, everyone was involved. And the local team, finally, they won, right? They got them fired. But man, that was ugly. Millions wasted. And then I'm always encountering like the second case here where a local team is stuffed with assets or, or inventory or something that's just useless in China, right? Like, come on, this isn't even at the level. It's not, my, my, my daughter can draw better pictures than you guys can paint. You know, it's very, very sad, but this is the reality. Like brands treat China very dismissively. It's either too scary or confusing, or they don't want to deal with it. They just want it to be automatic, right? And, and so they, they do things. And then sometimes they take control of the whole budget. They take so much time, you miss out. I have a client, this last case here is a current client, a luxury brand. They're doing so well but it takes them two weeks to decide whether to use a certain influencer for a live stream. My team's going crazy. We've missed booking live stream for six months. They just don't get it. That speed, that cadence that China demands of you, okay? So what I say to people is that hiring for China is like choosing companions in love or life. It's messy, right? So when you come in as a brand, and Paul and, and Bryce and everyone will know, you're gonna encounter all these, these characters, these profiles on the left. You're gonna work with consultants. You're gonna have an agency. Likely you're gonna have a distributor, uh, retailers, Digos, 3PLs, lawyers. You're gonna work with platforms, all sorts of third parties. Now you're probably wondering how we fit into the chart, right? Well, we're a TP. At the end of the day, we're a trade partner uh, with 27 stores and 15 brands and you know 85 staff and the whole thing in China. And you know, we're like the second wife, right? It's a second marriage, we're round two. And the problem with being round two, the best way to describe it is, it sucks. It's like, I have to build the Brady Bunch. I mean, when I mean, I mean that sincerely. I mean, it's all about the stepkids and some of those stepchildren, I hate them. I hate the, <laughs> I hate the ex-wife, I hate everything, right? But that's what we deal with as a TP because there's all these legacy relationships call it baggage that you bring into your second marriage. So if you look at this, guys, I know you guys are dating or you're trying to find someone in life, but the truth is you can pretty much compare these relationships to the ones you're going through right now. Uh, and the, the devil on this chart is actually the person you trust the most. 
you know, it might be your best friend. That's your wingman, right? So you're going out or your wing girl, right? You're going out and you're trying to meet someone. The problem with these lawyers is they live in sort of a silo of professionalism, right? They're really good at doing certain things, just like a wingman, picking out the right one for you. But the problem is if they make mistakes, they're in charge of your structure, your legal structure, your contracts with your third parties, and most important, your IP registrations. And let me tell you, in this presentation, you're going to see how things go bad. Your wingman did not introduce you to the right girl, right? You met the wrong girl or guy, right? And you know what? <laughs> you get something that just doesn't go away from this, right? It's just, just like what's on this, this slide. It doesn't ever, it stays with you a long time. So risks abound whether you run China with a local team or through partners. Oh, wait a minute. There's no right structure. Yeah, there isn't, okay? Lots of stuff goes wrong when you go to China. Now, this happens in a lot of markets, but in particular, China is like this big black box to most people. And it is a very dynamic, competitive marketplace with the smartest, highest educated, like most professional consumers on earth. And the traders in China are just super sharp. Like here, people just operate at a different speed, different level, different forward thinking attitude. The companies here disrupt themselves every day because they know that if they don't, someone else will. And so you're un it's like a gladiator battle for everything, right? So people test you in China. It tests your stamina, okay? It tests a lot of things. I'm gonna give you one case here because I've seen everything from sabotage to hijackings. But the one story I thought might be really interesting for you so we mentioned that you may not necessarily avoid risk hiring a local team. You may not do it with partners. So how can you do it? Can you do it with a local team and partners? Well, how about this? So a few years ago, well, about five years ago, uh, I had a client and it was an ANZ cosmetics brand, a lovely brand that was the typical story of the foreign brand coming to China. They were a happy accident. They were successful by accident in China. Okay, activated through Daigo's and which are, you know, if for all those in Shanghai, you know what a Daigo is. But for those not, it's like an overseas professional shopper. It's someone who shops for family and friends at home and other people. Um, so these Daigo's activated the brand as well as influencers who are coming into uh, places in ANZ and, you know, using the brand and then talking about it. So they decided to build a local team. Instead of hiring seasoned people, they hired college graduates because they were a bit of a smaller firm. They didn't have the money. Um, and so they hired people with a, not much experience. And those people were given the charge of finding partners. So they interviewed a bunch of people and they ended up hiring someone who spoke really well, had a great presentation. So they signed a five-year exclusive. And the reason is the guy offered money. He's like, look, I'll give you a million dollar order up front and then I'll do that every quarter. You know, I'm going to be your, your exclusive in China. I'm going to do everything for you. I'm going to give you a million bucks cash. And that, you know, the owner of the company in ANZ was like, wow, I, I can't turn this down, right? She's like, this, I can't turn this money down. So she took the deal. Fast forward two years, disaster. So I get brought in to do an audit and see if we can take over. So I'm contacting Tmall. I'm contacting all these third parties and no one will talk to me about it. They're just like, oh, no, no, uh, we can't get involved. I'm like, what do you mean you can't get involved? You're the platform, right? Right? And so they're like, no, no, we, we don't get involved in these kind of disputes. I'm like, yeah, yeah, actually, you do, because I work with you every day on it. And they're like, no, 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 we're not going to touch it. So then I asked uh, the trade commission, like, what's going on? No, no, just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. So then I was in a meeting with her team, and she decided, she said, look, I, I need to talk with you. So this is the owner. And she flew into Shanghai, and she said, let's go have a coffee. So we got a coffee. And I said, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Why can't anyone help you? And she looked at me and said, look, this is what happened. Um, the guy who is our exclusive, you know, distributor online, she's like, I didn't know this because when the team was interviewing, you know, they, they said they did due diligence and this and that, but, you know, I trusted them too much and we didn't do any background checks. We didn't, you know, get reference checks. <laughs> My God, if you were hiring anyone, you would check at least three references. So this guy got the job because he impressed a bunch of young people in China with his abilities to do the business. Let's start with, he'd never done it before. No cosmetics background, no retail background, nothing. 
Do you know what his previous business was? This will blow your mind. He manufactured weapons for export to the Eastern European and African countries. He's an arms dealer, an arms dealer, right? And the guy wanted to get out of the business to go into a legitimate trade. So I'm thinking to myself, oh man. And I just knew in our eyes defeat. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I can't touch this. This is a very dangerous man, okay? So guys, things can go wrong in all the scenarios, right? Let's take a look at some examples of when you hire a local team. Okay, I have a current client, a sports brand. We love this client, okay? His, his executive team is awesome. They hired a local team, um, some bilingual local staff, right? We're a bit young, you know, and it's fine. But the problem is we gave them a, a JD, a job description of what we wanted him to hire. And instead he hired someone he liked that, that, that could translate, you know, was very good at English, but had absolutely no marketing or brand building experience. And started bossing around my senior brand team. So this is someone who's like 20 years younger than, than my marketing director, right? And, and their whole team is like this. And so, you know, my team was getting very angry and then they started making horrible decisions. The agency who does the, you know, a lot of the influence marketing, they're calling me complaining. Eventually it got a, a big blow up and we had to take it to their executive board. There's a PE fund involved who owns them. And I had to have a, come to Jesus meeting and say, hey guys, look, this just isn't gonna work. You know, this is the wrong butts in the wrong seats, but more importantly, these people are not good for your brand. Anyway, that whole team got fired. And now of course, you know, a year later, things are wonderful and everything's going well. But that's an example of a local team with little competency. So the competency skill hired was language and communication, but actually what the project required was brand building and marketing skills. Now, this isn't necessarily possible in the same person or persons. And so this is something we see all the time, a local team that just doesn't have the skills, okay? They don't have the right skills, okay? Um, this next case is current. Uh, this is actually quite sad, and, and, and it's sad for a reason. The actual local team, wh whether they're overpaid or not is another question, right? And they are, but they're awesome. They're superstars, okay? Uh, but the issue with this business, it's about 120 million uh, RMB business online, is that the way they hired and the way they incentivized this team, you get punished if you take risks or don't make smart or safe choices. So the team, which is a very talented team, is just happy to get paid a lot. So they've been making the safest choice, brand names or third parties that the corporate office knows to run the business right, in China. And what ends up happening, you pay five times as much for everything. So their business is totally unprofitable. It's been going on for a long time until we took over. And literally they ended up shutting down the office and getting rid of the team, which was really sad because if they had just created an environment that encouraged this team to take ownership, it would have been very successful, okay? It would have been very successful, but this team had a lack of ownership specifically because of the corporate office. But this can happen everywhere. And I know you guys, I mean, some of the senior people listening have seen this happen in their lives, right? Where they're in a job, they don't wanna risk their position and they don't want mud on their face. So you just go with the safe choice. It's good enough, right? Actually in China, it's not. You have to constantly take risks and be willing to use alternative sources and vendors to do things where you can't make money. Because people like us, we use those vendors. We're not afraid of those risks. And you're competing with people like us for the same traffic, for the same consumer, okay? Uh, another example, uh, sadly, um, is this brand whose Hong Kong office, they were very dismissive about China. I think it's because they manufacture in China. And this is like prejudice, right? It's made in China. It's not made for China. I can't possibly see Chinese people as consumers. So it's just snobbery, right? So because they were dismissive, they gave the task of choosing a China partner to one of their junior staff, who's like, hmm, carte blanche, goes and signs up an exclusive with a no name to get kickbacks. And we discovered it within two months of getting involved in the project. Now that's upsetting, this lack of ethics, right? Now you can't prevent that. There's dishonest people everywhere. And this guy happened to be in Hong Kong, but you know, there's dishonest people everywhere, but if you would care just a little, 
right? About China, you know, you weren't so neglectful. You would have had a good wingman, right? You would have had a lawyer who would have put in some contracts in IP right correctly, licenses correctly. So you could have gotten out of the situation, right? But again, this, this possibility of having an unethical local team, it, 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 it's real, right? And you guys have to be prepared for it. Now, then the other one here is a footwear brand. And this is just a very upsetting, shameful and on their behalf. So this company, which I thought was great when we started with them, immediately I realized there was something smelled wrong in their organization. It was like some kind of cancer that had metastasized throughout the place. And what it was, was the entire team in a nutshell majored in minor things. So essentially everyone in the company tracked what I called minute detail. Stuff that just doesn't matter, like on a spreadsheet, the decimal point, instead of dealing with the main problem, which was they had horrible quality, unacceptable in China. Not only that, their packaging was disgusting and dirty and had like, you know, soup noodles and stuff in it. I mean, they just had no good quality control across their organization. And they ended up hiring guard dogs to micromanage my team and other partners in the business whole thing. We resigned the account. We're like, we can't work with these people. And this lack of integrity, organizational and with your local team is a problem. If you have this kind of cancer, you need to cut it out and start over. It just doesn't work in China. And that business fell apart, which is sad. Uh, the last case here uh, is a luxury brand. Okay. And this is the typical attitude with luxury brands, clients like this, right? They had a wonderful local team. This team built the brand in China, right? But when it comes to budgets and deciding on vendors, they ignore the team. Team gets no feedback. So they took the budget back themselves and had their procurement department, like literally like a purchasing manager. Really? This guy buys leather straps and buttons and buttons. That's his job to choose the agency partner on price for a luxury brand. I know you all know that's not going to work, right? You already know you're studying marketing and PR. Let's be clear. David Ogilvy is right. You pay peanuts, you get monkeys, especially when you're looking for creative talent and you need an image to project in China. If you hire the TP on price, you're screwed. You hire the agency on price, you're screwed, completely screwed. And I'm not saying you have to overpay, but having someone who buys leather straps and buttons decide on a team that you're like, decide on who you marry for the next five years is crazy talk. And also even represent the brand and the voice of the brand. So partners, well, there's lots of problems here, right? Um, let's look at an outdoor brand. So this brand um, bought, uh, I'm sorry, hired an agency, signed exclusively with an agency in Hong Kong, a joint venture partner. To me, it's just like a scam, right? Uh, that had absolutely no experience setting up businesses in China let alone e-commerce and digital, okay? Now they have physical retail in Hong Kong, right? Some, not much, and they're from Europe. And I'm like, so you hired a couple of Europeans who have a couple of stores in Hong Kong, who've never been to China or run a business there to do all your planning for the market, completely incompetent. And they're going around knocking on doors. Now, at this point, we, we've signed directly with the brand and kicked them out because we can't deal with the incompetence sake. But understand that this can happen with anyone, right? You choose a partner because you like them. You can communicate with them easily. They seem smart and polished. They got a great presentation. They could also be charlatans, right? It could be smoke and mirrors. Now, this beauty brand, I was on the phone with this CEO a few days ago. She's amazing, like what she's done with this brand in the States. I mean, incredible what she's done in the last 10 years. And I don't know what it was, some legacy decision but they had this weird loyalty to a distributor that they hired for Hong Kong who handled China via cross-border tourism into Hong Kong. Now, until the protests and COVID, that was probably a very good business for them. But since then, they've allowed this legacy to destroy their business in China. And what I mean is, it's like you guys are in marketing, brand building, you know, whatever you're studying and PR, what's the one thing you don't wanna do? You don't wanna let a third party ruin your brand positioning in a market. And what they did was create a new product line that's almost like a private label. The brand doesn't sell outside of China in a line that's less than, let's say, 10% of their business globally and which they don't care about. And then they built the brand in China on a line that the brand doesn't want to carry. 
So the shame is the brand has wonderful traction in China, but it's on stuff that they don't even want or sell. And so we're starting from zero and it's miserable, right? I don't, you know, it's exciting because we love the brand, but man, starting from zero when they have so much traffic and potential is a shame. Uh, next one here is uh, one of my favorite stories. It's a brand that was midsize in personal care in the US and then was bought by my client, very large group. And they discovered a problem when they wanted to roll out the brand online in China. They realized that they couldn't get any traffic. So they had us in to go and audit and see what the hell was going on. And we found out they didn't own any of the IP on the brand. We're like, whoa, 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 how did this happen? And I'm like, well, dig in. And what we found out was they hired a brilliant name strategist and a great attorneys who really didn't do them a good, good service. And what I mean is they didn't work in their best interest. They were arrogant. And how so? They came up with a clever name in Chinese to register. Unfortunately, it would have taken anyone in my office five seconds to look up the nomenclature that Chinese consumers use to describe this brand online in China and in the digital ecosystem. Like three seconds, there's three characters that mean this brand. And these characters don't even sound like the brand itself. They're like a generic category. It's a meme that became the brand's name in China to Chinese consumers. This distributor of theirs register that IP and everything like it, routes all the traffic to themselves, has a 200 million RMB business digitally on the brand. Do you know how much the brand does on their flagship in Timo? 10 million RMB, that's it. It's been five years, they can't get it back. So that's how important it is, you know? You hire a distributor, they don't, you know, they're brand squatters, they're all over China, they play against you. This is a high performing distributor, but they understood the IP game and the brand itself owns IP in China. It's just not worth anything. So something to think about, you can't prevent ethics, but you can have competent support on the way in. Now, uh, this nutrition brand, this is annoying uh, because we have to work with this agency and they are horrible, right? They're the worst of the worst. They have no integrity. They break all their promises. They say they're going to do something and don't do it. And this went on for so long that we ended up, that they ended up getting fired, but the brand lost millions of RMB for them. And last on this is, is, is another typical solution. So a global office doesn't want to deal with anything but the local market. So they hire a global rollout company. Doesn't matter if it's, you know, however they describe themselves someone that's gonna take you abroad, whether as a distributor or a services provider, but they may not be smart in every market, right? But they sign globally, because it's what? It's easy. The problem is in this case, this luxury brand signed with a global operator, once they get the exclusive on China, they then outsource the work to people like us. They hired a college graduate with no experience to hire operators based on price for a luxury brand. I mean, that's insane, right? So again, that same problem. Now, you're probably like, wow, maybe I should hire my mother. Like, what do I do? I can't trust anyone, right? I can't trust anyone. Uh, you know, no matter where I go, I'm going to lose a leg, right? It's like a minefield, isn't it, China? Actually, it's not, right? And uh, don't worry about it. It's not always like this. So let me give you some good news, right? So it showed you some bad scenarios. Now let's do the good ones, all right? And these are current clients of mine right? And it doesn't matter whether they outsource it to us and run it from abroad or whether their local team runs us, right? But they have a local team that does it. All of these success of, of these cases are very successful, okay? I want you to look at the words on this slide, okay? Because you notice the highlights here. What is very obvious when you look at these slides, right? I'm going to give you my three rules, Okay, of getting, of doing business in China, right? Get serious is rule number one. Get serious. And you know what that means, right? If you're going to run a marathon, you train two to three hours a day. You want to win a triathlon, you try and train six hours a day for months, right? Get serious. China is about planning and training for success. That is what it takes. So you'll notice here that every single one of these clients is deadly serious about China, whether they have a huge operation with bilingual foreigners 
great local team and been in China for 10 years and are culturally and linguistically fluent, or they have a seasoned executive team that's serious, confident, committed, open-minded, and humble, willing to learn, see their partners as mentors, and treat China like a golden goose, right? They treat it like a golden goose with kid gloves. And it's something important. You'll see that in all of these cases, whether it's a local team that's given full autonomy and a transparent relationship where they can drive success on their own, and that's a humility of the head office saying to themselves, in this case of this mom and baby brand, you know, we didn't do China well, right? <laughs> We're going to go for round three. This was their round three. They hired a local team that's phenomenal and we love them. Okay. And they were given full autonomy and the project is super successful. Right. And in the case of this apparel brand, they treat us like mentors. Their whole executive team wants to learn. Even the PE fund gets involved all the time to learn, to learn and make change. And so the relationships are built with this transparency and they're fluid and we're all very connected, just like it should be. It's like we're an extension of their company. And I feel like that's what you want. You want a, bu a bunch of A players around you and you have to all have the same attitude to be successful in China, okay? So rule number one is get serious. Rule number two, get smart. Stop being stupid. Don't hire people unless you interview them. Check references. Get highly recommended, right? Go and audit, do background checks. I mean, I know parents over here who have background checks on boyfriends back in the States. They run background checks. Their daughters don't even know about it, right? They run a background check on boyfriends. When they're at the office, they don't do that with their partners in China. Right? Do they? Diligence. Okay? Diligence. Get serious. Get smart. Learn what you need to know to be successful. And if you don't know, admit it. Be confident and committed and open-minded and humble. Be humble in the face of something much bigger than you. And rule number three is get going. Stop sitting there on your hands. China moves 25 times faster than everywhere else. Every time I fly from Hong Kong back to Shanghai, I say I'm going back to the future for a reason, right? China's gone five iterations. It's been two years. I'm, go back. I'm not even going to recognize Shanghai. It's going to be completely different. Everything. What people are doing. I heard you walk in, everyone scans your face. You don't even need to pull your phone out. You can pay for things. I mean, it's insane, okay? It's insane, the pace, right? So cadence, pace. And those are the things you need right? You need this team. Now, if I wanted to boil it down to just a few things, what do the successes and failures have in common? Because we've looked at what? We've looked at the question of where, right? Is the team local? Is it overseas? Can I run it from broad? Can I do it through partners? We've looked at two things, a where and how, and maybe even a what, right? But I think what you've seen, right, is a common theme here. What is the problem? What do they have in common? What is the real question we're dealing with? I'm going to tell you, it's a who. It's a who question. It's not a where. It's not a how. It's not a what. It's a who. Right? And the who is the why. Why is that successful? Because of the who. Why did it fail? Because of the who. Right? So most foreign brands coming into China, okay, this is a neat little you know, what do you call these? A quadrant graph, right? A lot of marketing consultants use this, right? Everyone loves these. So I threw it in here because you're all students. You're going to see these someday if you haven't used them yet. And, and what it is, is a framing exercise. Okay. And I get these in corporate decks every day. You see Paul smiling. Oh my God. I made one yesterday. Oh, wait, no, I did one this morning. Five. Wait, I did five of these. Okay. This is a positioning exercise. You pick two factors and you say, where do you fall? Now I've got all the cases I've mentioned, right? You've seen them all. 18 cases, all right? Now, when foreign brands come into China, they index their choices based on trust and performance or perceived performance, okay? So when I go ahead and graph all those cases of failure and success against whether the relationship was high performing, but low trust, low performing, low trust, or high trust, low performance, and then high trust, high performance. What was interesting was only the good cases 
actually fall into the highest performing. And what does that mean for you? Okay, what does that mean to you? It means that you need a combination of things to be truly successful in China. So your success should be a pleasure, right? It should be a pleasure. And having a relationship that performs for you gives you money at the expense of your brand, ownership of your own IP, and control of China doesn't work. A relationship that you can talk to the person easily, but they can't do crap for you in China because they're not competent doesn't work. And obviously, low trust, low performance doesn't work at all. Fire them, right? Get rid of them, okay? So what do you want? You want high trust, high performance relationships, okay? And to me, they have several characteristics. You can see them here on the slide in the upper right corner. That's some of the things that you want to look for in a client or in a partner or in a staff member. But I think all of you know instinctually when you get into business with someone or you work with them on a team or you're on a project as a student, you know right away what you're looking for. And to me, it's one word here, right? It's, it's one word. It's about this meaty, juicy, thick, ironclad integrity, right? There's just something about it. And you can't have integrity just by walking your talk. That's one way to say it. Another is that sort of combination of factors in both the people you're working with and their actual objective performance. Because sometimes things work against you. There's a lot of factors at play. Markets change, you could have a bad year, but you don't wanna change the team, right? So it's how do you evaluate this trust and performance grid for yourself? So when I look at success, what is success, okay? in terms of a hiring policy for China. And by the way, I bet this is what you want to do outside China, right? I just don't know outside China. I only know China, right? But I bet you, you can use the same blueprint if you expand your brand into any other country, any other country, okay? doesn't matter where you go. This is going to matter most. And it matters because these things you see on this puzzle add up to one thing, okay? They add up to one thing. And it's the thing that it's not one or the other, okay? So if you think about all these character traits, what do you think they mean? What is the missing piece here? What is the one thing that matters that all of these things that you see here add up to when you enter a new market? You know, ownership, skill, cultural fluency, transparency, competency, integrity, values. What, what is this all about, okay? It's about trust. And the true definition of trust is not separate from performance, okay? They're not different things. Just because someone can sell a lot or do a lot for you doesn't mean they're trustworthy. So to me, what you want is real trust. And I wanna leave you with a quote from the book that I mentioned that you should be reading. So you can see how poignant it is. This is a fictionalized biography of Sam Zamuri. And this quote is Sam, telling the corporate head office of the company he just bought, the executive directors, what to do about their operation overseas because they're not happy with the team, right? Trust them if you trust them. And if you don't get rid of them and get people you do trust. And trust is about all of those character traits. And that's it guys, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Josh, uh, a lot to think about. Um, and uh, wonderful, fast-paced uh, storytelling. So uh, a lot, lots of themes to, to reflect on there. And I think your point is very, very well taken that some of these lessons are true for anywhere where you do business and any kind of partnerships you build. And I, I particularly like that you're focused on these factors, which sometimes, unfortunately, glibly get called soft factors, you know, or, or, but really are... Are, are central to the success of many ventures uh, around the world. So um, let me see if we have any questions. I'm gonna probably ask Paul and Bryce if you had some questions ahead of time and then I will look at the uh, Q&A and see if there's anything that's come in there. So can I remind anybody who's uh, on with us and they have a question um, for Josh to pop that in the Q&A is the easiest thing. Um, we will follow up 
I see some other things like names of books. We'll get those from Josh and we'll follow up. I'll do that right email now. Answers. Perfect. And I, I promise you guys, you're in college, you're reading a lot of academic material. You're going to really enjoy this book. And it's basically all you ever need to know about expanding a business abroad. And of course, the entrepreneurial story is great too, if you want to start a business someday. But the main point is to get the gold nuggets from that book about operating overseas and how to manage a team and how to set up a successful ship. So please ask questions. I noticed, and I was happy to see, equal numbers of A's and B's uh, on, mm. on the, in the chat. That was, that was good to see, right? Because you were both right. Right, you're both right. There was no wrong answer. Hey, Josh, I got a question. This is Bryce here. Yes. Uh, so I always call this the CMO's dilemma. You're a CMO, you're based in France, and China is now not, it could be your number one market or your number two market. Now you're a global CMO and you are responsible for the marketing operations and execute, you know, you're, you're, you're responsible for the strategy for the entire world. How do you balance your, let's say, how do you balance that relationship with, with your local team in China? How much leeway can you give them versus how much things that you should yourself be responsible for? For the, at the end of the day, you are the global CMO and China is an important market for you. So the first thing is marketing is about values. So I think if you feel that that team in China shares your values and believes in the brand at its core, then I don't think they won't serve you well, they'll serve you great. And I think the um, autonomy that you need to give them is after you guys have done your brand positioning properly for the market. So I think if you don't go through that level of, of, of brand consideration, uh, analysis and really that positioning for the market, then as a global CMO, you're never going to be confident in your team in China because you all didn't agree on it together. So that alignment is key. Um, and I think the brand guidelines should be um, strict, but also leave room for technique. So what do I mean by that? I mean, the overall strategy for the brand in China should be aligned with the global ambition but localized for China in terms of its execution. And that's where the global CMO has to learn to trust. So for example, outside China, you are running a static commerce business. Let's just use e-commerce for a minute. Everything's static. All your websites are radically oversimplified with five words on every image, no copy, nothing, nothing talking about the performance of the product. And then you come to China and you realize you go onto a PDP on Tmall and there's like 400 pages about one product. And you say, well, no, no, we can't do that. Actually, you can't, and you need to. So there's, there's, that's where it has to stop. You, you have to balance the image and the brand values and the guidelines with what's going to work in China or any other market you go into. And so I have a client, which is a great example for you, from Italy that does this super well. And I don't know if it was just by necessity or luck or desperation, but they've been around about 75 years they are the number one in their category. It's a connoisseur brand. It's a luxury brand. It's super expensive to own this stuff. I mean, you got to be racing Ducatis to even think about it. And they're wildly successful in China. I mean, shockingly so. Uh, one of my biggest clients, they have two brands. Both brands are successful. And the way they've localized for China, it's a bit complicated, but I have to confess it works. They haven't decided that one person can do everything right. So they split it up. They've got a partner who's their importer who does the distribution. They have a technical partner, us. They've got a brand building and marketing partner, okay? And the corporate office's attitude is, here is the brand. Here are the assets and the values. And here is what we expect you to be able to produce. And then they let the local people change it slightly. And what I mean is, they do things, even though it's a luxury brand, they're able to take what is the core of the brand and actually map it out across something they're not doing in Italy, as an example. And it's actually quite a brilliant strategy because in Italy, they reached their peak many, many decades ago, but then they've been so wildly successful abroad and yet it hasn't done any damage to the brand. And I think that has to do with their regional management structure more than anything else. 
in every region, they have someone that's from corporate that is, uh, they cut their teeth as a young person going to multiple markets. So they like send them to a market that's not that important to start, beat them up and send them to a little bit more important market and they build them up until they can handle a major region. And those people have that skill set to guide. So back to the CMO, it's the same model, right? You could, you could copy this model where you go from global to regional to local, right? You, and that's just one example of a client that does that well. I mean, I, I think there's many ways to skin this cat, seriously. And I've seen it work in too many different ways to give an answer that's hard, hard right or hard left. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool, Josh. Paul, you got a question? Yeah, I, I, I want to build on that, right? So I love the matrix that you put together, Josh, right? Like I'm a big fan of, 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 of matrices and things, you know, a plan on a page. Um, one of the factors that always comes up in China, uh, especially when you're dealing with these SMEs or these new entry is cost, right? And if anything, trust is no, it's not a value. It's not a, it's not a, it's not on any axis at all, right? So costs, uh, and then that relates to business model, right? So how do we, how are we compensated as a partner? How are we compensate as an agency? Well, we can't give you a fixed fee, which means that you can't hire up front, but we will, we will give you a commission on performance that will only happen in the future. How do you sort of rectify that, um, that scenario? And then a lot of times these companies have procurement, right? So if you, even if you have a CMO that's in charge of the brand, you still have to then pass it off to the procurement team that their only KPI is saving costs. Yeah. What, where's the balance there? I mean, to me, there is no balance there, right? So when your departments are set up that way, China's gonna break you. You're set up for failure. There's no way around that. I mean, I hate to say it, but that structure doesn't work. That pass off, I've never seen it work. It just doesn't, unless you get lucky, right? So you have to make some changes. I think that's the, you know, like I said, rule number one, get serious. China's different. It's five times faster, 20 times better. It's faster, cheaper, and better at pretty much everything when it comes to digital, period. Marketing, tech, systems, delivery, everything. Everything's better. Everything's faster. Everything's cheaper. Everything's more efficient. Shockingly, even better at branding and marketing now than, than the West, right? Just iteration upon iteration of better. So the reality is you got to get serious, which means that structure isn't going to work. And I don't care if internally you use that outside China. Again, you could do what this Italian brand did. You can have a regional structure that has full autonomy and trust in the head office. And they make decisions in a local level. They either if they don't want the risk, they don't want to you know, uh, do fees or, or pay performance, they get a distributor to do the cash flow side of it and take no risk. And then once it gets good, they go in and take over. I mean, you've got many, many options. Is structurally that you have more than one option. You have almost limitless choices. Um, and what I find is that rigidity, that inflexibility, is the hallmark of brands that are about to lose their shirts in China. Now, you may not lose it on the front end, but you lose it on the back, or you lose the long term game, or your competitors just outdo you. So, you as a brand coming into China, your number one priority is to train the team that's overseeing it to think like a startup. So my favorite brands are my D2C clients. They're young. The companies haven't been around more than 10 years. They still have the juice, right? They're set up to win in China. They don't show up with that procurement manager to go source agencies, right? It's, it's not a sourcing job. You're not buying leather, okay? You're not buying fabric, okay? What they send me is questions. They bring an international director, the head of influence, the head of community, right? Now that should tell you something, right? The people that I sit in the room with from a D to C are always this, a founder or two, head of international, who always brings in head of influence, head of community, head of growth, head of the, have you seen these titles in big companies? No, very rare. Actually you do in some, right? And maybe you should learn from it. You know, if you go and you look at the playbook of D to C, one of the best ones, for all you students out there, if you're interested in marketing at all, go read neilpatel.com. Neil Patel did a piece on the D2C playbook. It's so well-written, it's fun to read. And it's, it's something that if you look at this, if you live in China and you look at this like, oh, we've been doing that for 10 years. Yeah, oh, I did that seven years ago, right? But that should get your mindset around what it takes to win. That's the mindset. You, Alibaba 
is the best example of a company at such massive scale that acts and runs and lives and breathes as a startup with a bunch of guru leader teacher types. They're like this, this group. It's got a brain trust of professors that run around and teach all the young people what to do and put lots of pressure on them. And they constantly disrupt their business every year. Every year, they just keep disrupting it. And all the guys do this, constant disruption. They have to. You can't thrive in China unless you're willing to disrupt yourselves, your, your management structure, the way you do business. And you've got to adapt this mindset that number one, China's big. Number two, it's bigger than you. Number three, have a sense of humility and respect for it. Realize that what you're doing at home probably won't work, but some of the things you're doing do work that are timeless. I always tell people, what do you need to be in China? Unfair advantage. Hey, go to the accelerator. Go knock on China accelerator. Ha, huh. what does a foreigner need to be successful in China? Unfair advantage. How do you do that? You have to own a commodity. You've got to have a technology. You've got to have what? IP. You've got to have a brand worth selling. How do you build a brand worth selling? Well, you make it famous. You make it awesome. You, you have heritage, you have legacy, you have providence, you've got traction, you're hot. If you don't have a team that makes you do those things internally, you're going to struggle in China because every other Chinese brand kicks your ass. Not just the factories. Taobao has 60 million merchants, Paul. There's 60 million stores there. People think like today it's more competitive in China than it was five years ago. No, it's not. It's the same. There's still 60 million merchants and 10 million of them make the stuff. They're factories. You're competing against consumer direct, manufacturer direct commerce is what China is. It's an M to C market. So the only way you can win is if you're a good enough brand to survive, have the stamina and the traction to drive yourself above the fray. If you're competing on price, forget it. If you're competing, I mean, you just can't do it. It's just not going to work. It doesn't work short term. It doesn't even work long term. Right. So that's the answer to your question. I know it's a long one, but in the end, what do you need? Act like a direct to consumer brand. Same portfolio. Bring those skills to China. You'll find the partners here will be much more willing to work with you. The better ones like, oh, yeah, like, like I got a potential client from the UK. I didn't win them, but they are awesome. I mean, their team. Holy God. I mean, it is a D to C. It's about 10 years old. I mean, the way they run that business, it's just unreal. It's uh, it's everything you want. It's and they're growing crazy. And I know why the excellence in that operation and the mindset to do whatever it takes is what you need to win in China. Do whatever it takes. So that's getting serious. That's getting smart. And that's getting moving. Right. So if you're not moving too slow, you're not you're treating it like crap. You're like, ah, I don't know. I'm neglectful. Oh, it's only going to I was talking to a guy and it's, he should be embarrassed, who is the managing director of one of the largest footwear brands in the world. And he said to me. <laughs> on the phone. I couldn't believe it. It's like, you know, for the first few years when we go to China, it's just going to be too small for us to do blah, 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 blah. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's your attitude? So he goes out and you can see it in his partner selection. Just arrogant, this and that. I'm like, they failed once in China. They failed twice in China. This is round three. They're going to fail again. That is the attitude of the senior leadership neglectful, dismissive, cavalier, <laughs> not good enough for them. I had a client's like, we can do, your projections aren't ambitious enough. We can do more business in Finland. Yeah, tomorrow with five people. Are you serious? Do you want to, like, is that your business model? Incrementally, I'm going to win Finland, right? Finland, five million people. My block in Shanghai has 10, right? The population of all of Scandinavia is in Hongqiao. Right? I had my kids at the American school. We lived at the racket club. The population of Scandinavia lives in Hongqiao. That's a district of Shanghai. The whole population. Right? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Right? And, and this, I deal with this every day. And I, it's so frustrating. I just had that conversation. Finland. Comparing China to Finland. I'm like, you know, you guys deserve what you get. Right? That's your attitude. Well, Finland will give us an order. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to give you a slap. Let's just go with the facts. Okay? China is not for wimps, okay? It's not for wimps. You need stamina. You need to be the best of the best, period. Operationally, ethically, brand-wise, marketing-wise. I mean, there's no area of your operation that will not be challenged by China. It just won't. It, everything's going to put pressure on you to be better. Okay? So, Josh, so, I'm going to bring you, I'm going to bring you yeah. down to earth a little bit as well, because yeah. I think... Uh, 
it's a powerful and compelling story uh, you've told. I think uh, you probably frightened a few folks as well, but uh, perhaps uh, advisedly so. But let me ask you a question for the students. You know, we have a mixture of um, Chinese students who are studying with us in New York, some in Shanghai. We also have, you know, students from all around the world, many of whom might want to work in China. So take two different audiences. Yes, you're, you're a Chinese national, you're a student in marketing and PR at NYU. What do you think they need to know, learn, skills they need to develop to make them awesome, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a potential employer in, 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 in China and, and vice versa for a student who doesn't have that sort of national and cultural background, what, what, what makes them a standout potential employee? Oh, this is a great question, actually, because you're wondering how we hire. Uh, and we do. We hire a lot of college graduates, obviously. Um, so let's see. Who's the best? I would say, uh, it, it, first of all, it depends on what we're doing. We hire for character and train for skills because we don't, you know, the, our business is not big, right? We're like a mid-size operator. So we're not, we're not paying like for super senior people, right? I mean, you don't have like a senior team of people who answer Wang Wangs and customer service, right? So our organization has like 85 people. They're pretty diverse and the, the salary levels are all over the place. So we have to hire college graduates. Uh, what I look for, and uh, I'll give you an example, my accounts team, which is the greatest team to be on because it's the one I run, uh, the, the front end, the marketing accounts team. So what do we have on there? Best to share experiences. I have about, I think, 10 people who manage accounts for me of various skill sets and backgrounds. So they're all very interesting. Let's call them halfies, okay? And what I mean by that is half their time in China, half the time not in China, okay? So they are foreigners, who didn't grow up in China, but then lived in China forever, had a crazy China experience and get it. And of course, I'll be frank with all of you. If you are not truly bilingual, you cannot work on my team as a young person. You're just useless to me. Okay. And no offense, right? If you are senior level, you might be partner level where you bring in business. You can, you can handle those tough client facing activities. Uh, you can drive a team. You have executive skill, but if you're young and you're fresh, for me, language is important, but it's not important because I need you to speak it better than me. It's important because I need you to speak culture. And if your Chinese isn't good enough, it means you don't have cultural fluency, usually, unless you've spent an insane amount of time in China, in which case you're also qualified. So your Chinese has to be good enough to get along with a Chinese team. My team is mostly Chinese. So if you're a foreigner on staff, you do have some language skills. And if you don't have language skills, your cultural skills are superior. You get it. You know, most of the foreigners who are really successful in China that I've met don't even speak Chinese, but they're culturally fluent or their Chinese sucks. It's good enough. It's polite. Right? It's good enough. It's business Chinese. It's not like mine because I started in 95 as an anthropology student in China. So, you know, I live with my I do also weird field work. So my Chinese is a little bit alien for most people now. Um, but you need, just needed to be good enough, but your cultural experience in China, getting situations in China and understanding Chinese from that level is quite important, right? And that would be true whether you are working on actual like execution or front end client relations. Does that make sense? So ling linguistics, cultural fluency is what I'm looking for. So here's what they look like. I have a girl, she's Chinese by origin. She was born and raised in Madrid. Her family's from Wenzhou. She speaks five languages, okay? She speaks English, obviously perfectly, Spanish and a bunch of others and two Chinese dialects. And she's based in my Shanghai office. I have another one who is Korean, but grew up in Beijing for a number of years. Her dad was an expat, then went back to Korea. She's got a consulting background. She was very young when I hired her. Uh, and um, she's an absolute superstar, like A++ plus 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 player. Her Chinese is great. It's not perfect, doesn't have to be. She's an absolute superstar, but she also has that cultural fluency. My head of product, for example, is Korean Taiwanese. He grew up in Beijing as well and Shanghai and then immigrated to Canada and was a Korean Naval officer. He speaks four languages fluently, including Portuguese. His wife's Brazilian. So this is the kind of character you see on my team. To be honest, they're all badass. I, I'm scared of them. 
Uh, most of my team, and then another thing that's an anomaly in my business is most of my team are women. My business is run by tiger women. That's like 80% of my staff. They are amazing. And they tend to be very good at culture and linguistics. So that makes sense, right? So a lot of my accounts team, I have a, a girl who uh, spent some time in the UK for university and after, she's an account manager. So you'll see this. They can either be born in China and go abroad and have the cultural experience to create a bridge, or they're not born in China, but they get China and they're really good at it. So those are the two things. Now, skills. I'm gonna give you the number one skill and number two skill if you wanna be in marketing. Period. Okay. Number one and number two, I guess they're pretty much the same thing. You have to be great at copywriting, communicating in written form, okay, that resonates with an audience. So if you can't write something that gets people to respond, it's a problem for me. You can't be on my marketing team. Just that's it. You can't connect with people with the way you communicate in writing. There's just no way you're going to make it. Copywriting is the most under, undervalued skill in the world, but it is extremely important in China, okay? Second and equally important is visual thinking skills, right? So what's the best way to become a good visual thinker other than to have it as a natural? Go become a consultant out of school for two years. Train your mind to think how to organize information visually, simply so people can understand it. Visual thinking. These two skills will get you very far, copywriting and UX. So a sense of what people will love is that copywriting and that UX, right? That's the visual thinking. And great writers create word pictures. So and they can be good talkers, right? They, they, they tell stories, they do this well. Those two skills as a college student will get you extremely far. So the second you go to work and no matter what you start with, it doesn't even matter, the minute someone sees that you can write a letter or something that causes a massive response, your career prospects just went up 12x overnight, right? It's instant. Or they see that you can visualize things better than other people, you get 25 offers. Everyone tries to hire you. Can't be hired. You know, someone's trying to keep you, right? So, so this is what's desirable to me. Visual thinking skills, written skills. And then the other is personal presentation skills. Underrated. I think like the new generation is sloppy and casual and flighty and flaky and you know they need to be beat on i have to have i had someone come in my office and it doesn't matter where they're from could be foreign could be domestic you know they just don't dress right they don't shower enough you know stuff like this just sloppy you know it's not cool actually it's unprofessional and it's not cool so if you're gonna if i'm gonna put you in front of my clients like louis vuitton you need to look like those executives they dress to the nines Right. You know, if, if you're going to be put in front of a client, you need to look right, smell right, talk right. So invest in your communication skills, your written skills, your visual thinking and presentation skills and your verbal skills. This is what I look for. And then beyond that is character, ethics, integrity, how you handle yourself. Can you handle pressure? Uh, are you humble? Are you open minded? All those things you saw. Serious, humble open-minded, confident, thoughtful, creative. I'm looking for all of these. You know, you think outside the box, you can handle complexity. I look for all these things. Our interview process is kind of crazy. And in the end, we just take a lot of people because the interviews are a horrible indicator of performance. And what do I, you saw what I want for performance. Those things you can't find out in an interview. You can't even find out in a background check. You got to test them. So everyone that comes on board, is an intern for a while in a way, right? They're like, they're on trial to see if they're gonna make the grade because it's expensive to hire people in China. Um, and then of course, there's the ultimate skill, right? If you have it, it is valuable and it's valuable everywhere, not just in China. If you can sell, if you're good at influence, right? Not just with written or oral skills or presentation skills, but if you can connect with others and rain make for any company based in China, you'll do quite well for yourself. You can bring in the money, everyone loves you. Bring in the clients, you can do well. It doesn't matter if you speak the language, actually no one cares, right? At the end of the day, they'll work around you. So if you decide you wanna be a rainmaker, I highly recommend doing a very hard sales job, right? You know, it's interesting, Mormons have a unique advantage in communication as a culture. Why? 
I'll tell you why. Because each and every Mormon has to learn to proselytize. They have to go around door to door and try to get people to believe in something they could care less about. They have to learn to sell door to door. And that's hard, selling faith, right? Every single one of them does that. And what I find when I encounter them, they have extra good selling and communication skills. It's interesting um, because as a child, they're forced to do this. Now, it may be unpleasant for you, but that is a sort of uh, character defining moment, right? Whether you can do this. And in every role, whether it's in your personal life with your partner or your kids or your family or your friends, you have to learn to sell. So these are the skills we look for. And the most important are the two at the top. That's it. Those are my favorite. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us to a close there. You've very generously left your email address up there and your WeChat and LinkedIn uh, links, and I'm sure any students watching this who are so motivated will uh, get in touch with you. Um, it's been a really fascinating uh, trip around the bases, Josh. And um, I, I keep thinking to myself, I I, I want if I had a business to start in China, I I'd like to pick up the phone and talk to you, but. Uh, just uh, listening to some of these insights, and I know that there are probably many stripes, you know, uh, to get to where you got to this uh, level of wisdom and self-reflection probably didn't come with quite a few bruises as well. Um, so we are the beneficiaries of, of all of that. And I really want to thank you. I want to thank Paul and Bryce, as always, uh, for curating these things. And I think when um, Patrick Brady and Robin Smith, who've been helping us out, uh, hit the the, um, the the stop button, we all disappear. So before we disappear, I do want to say thank you again uh, to all three of you. So Awesome. Thank you, Michael, for having me. Bryce, thank you for the invitation. Paul, as always, it's awesome. Yeah, thank you, sir. And I, I'm grateful to all of you and, and honored by the attendance. Thank you. Fantastic. Come and see us in New York when you come over. We will. All right. All right. Take Excellent. care. Thanks. For, all right. Bye, Bye everyone. For now.